They used to take a real pork chop. They used to burn it in the fire so that the whole house would smell like a pork chop. And then they would eat this recipe. And they look exactly like a pork chop. I'm Robin Sessingham, and this is The Zest. Citrus, seafood, Spanish flavor, and southern charm. We're all about food in Florida. From matzah to tzimis to pastrami sandwiches, what is it with Jewish people and food? We talked to Miami's Jeannie Milgram, who found an ancient collection of her family's recipes that helped generations survive persecution and preserve their heritage. Support for the Zest podcast comes from Seitenbacher brand natural foods like muesli cereals, oils, oatmeal, energy bars, gluten-free fruit gummies for the kids, organic coffee, and more. Available in supermarkets, health food stores, or online at seitenbacher.com. I wanted to make sure that you know about stpetersburgfoodies.com. If you're looking for fun and good food in St. Pete, there are restaurant reviews and podcasts featuring local chefs, restaurateurs, happy hour suggestions, and a lot more. It's all online at stpetersburgfoodies.com. At The Zest, you know we believe that food is much more than just caloric intake. It can be a way for immigrants to connect with their ancestors and pass on traditions or a method of preserving long-forgotten memories. Jeannie Milgram is a Catholic-born Cuban-American in Miami who traced her roots back over hundreds of years to search out a story about her Jewish ancestors, the Spanish Inquisition, and old family recipes. She's the author of the cookbook, Recipes from My 15 Grandmothers. There is a lot to your story, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to recap a little bit of what was in your memoir. Your family escaped from Castro's Cuba to Miami in 1960. You were raised as a devout Catholic, but even so, you always felt a connection to Judaism. And um, you ended up converting uh, to Judaism, and in fact, even Orthodox Judaism. Correct. Um, along the way, you married at age 17. Um, you divorced. You raised two children as a single mom. And then you married. You ended up marrying a Jewish man. And eventually, um, you started doing genealogy. And you did not know that your background was Jewish. Um, tell me a little bit about that. Correct. And by the way, you did that so well. You know, you could sit in in my Zooms now and tell my story. Introduce you. Yeah. Yes, that would be amazing. So, yes. So after several years of marriage, um, I started uh, digging into the family background um, because my grandmother had left me some jewelry that was uh, like Stars of David and my mom had insisted that she be buried immediately. And so she and my my grandfather were first cousins. And that's when I went back to Spain. I went back to Portugal 15 years, maybe, for me to get a direct maternal lineage. Um, initially to 1545, when I wrote my, my first book, My 15 Grandmothers, but not really being able to fully document their Jewishness until I got back to 1405, 22 grandmothers in a row, pre-Inquisition Spain and Portugal. And that is when I found about 45 relatives that had been judged and burned to death in the Inquisition. These were the Jews in Spain that converted, ostensibly they converted because of the Spanish Inquisition, but many of them continued to practice Judaism in secret, which meant carrying on the traditions and the kosher food traditions. The kosher and food traditions are strong because when I read the Inquisition judgments, uh, what people were sent to the prisons for, a lot of it has to do with food. They would eat beans on a day that they weren't allowed to, or they would be eating meat, for example, on a time that they couldn't, like, let's say the Catholics don't eat meat during Lent. 
So they would be eating meat during Lent. And then they say, ah, oh, this one is not Catholic. And they take them in. Or they would be eating meat on a Friday. Back in the day, if you remember, only fish was eaten on Friday if you were Catholic. So um, a lot of what I was seeing was uh, food related was how they were being brought into the uh, Inquisition jails, which was incredible. Something that was interesting that you wrote about was that grew up, you came from Cuba to Miami, that Catholicism went back a long time. But you talk about the fact that there were these customs, especially in the kitchen with your maternal grandmother, that she called just family customs, but you realize later were actually based on Jewish dietary law. Correct. And those are very strong because my grandmother had five grandchildren. Four of us were granddaughters. So it was me that I guess from a very young age, I started questioning everything. And I mean, young, like six. And I was just questioning. So my grandmother saw that in me. They never said they were Jews, but she taught me For example, um, it's very forbidden for us in Jewish dietary law to consume any kind of blood. And uh, checking the eggs in a separate container before you put them into a recipe is like, that is the kosher 101. And she taught me to do that at a very young age. I used to bake with her. Another thing that is really so incredible was um, we take a little bit of the dough when we make more than five pounds of a recipe. And we burn it and until it, it just burns to a crisp. And that is done today by Jewish women when they make challah. It's a moment that you're giving like an offering of a little piece of the dough. And then you say special prayers and heavens are supposed to be opened uh, for these prayers when you, you take the time to do this. And my grandmother taught me to do this without the prayers. Take the dough, put it in aluminum foil, put it in the back of the oven and burn it. And checking the uh, lettuce and the vegetables for insects, we're forbidden to eat any kind of an insect. And man, my grandmother would, uh, you know, shake them out and and weed them out. And, you know, she used to cook a lot of Swiss chard, which is very buggy. And so I was taught all this and I just didn't put two and two together, even though I was learning about the Jewish faith. I just did not put two and two together. Yeah. And so the checking for the insects, as you say, it was a little, it was more than just washing, making sure that you got the sand out of the leaks. So it was more than washing the vegetables. There was this obsessiveness that she taught you about, about looking for insects. And as you said, it just, you know, it didn't really make sense in the context of nobody else is doing this. Right, exactly. But, but the, I didn't know, because if you're 11 or 12 and you're in your grandma's kitchen and she's teaching you, listen, this is how we do it in our family. And you're like, okay, you know, let me learn. And then when you get older and you start cooking around other people and they're going like, what? What are you doing? You know? Yeah. So, yeah. And my mom never, they never said anything open to me. My mom denied having any documents in her. Nothing, nothing. Years later, I found that a lot of those documents that took me 10, 11, 12 years to find, mom had the originals. You know, we moved her out of the house because she had Alzheimer's and took her to a memory care center. And that's when I started opening drawers and suitcases and going, oh my gosh, what is going on here? Documents that I paid a genealogist to dig out of files, there they were. So my dad's family and my mom's family went from the inquisitions of Sevilla, Spain, to Coimbra, Portugal, Lisbon, Portugal, um, and then down to Canary Islands Inquisition, and then Cuba. Meaning from both sides, this these grandmothers were yelling and screaming for me to, to return. So basically, it's both sides of the family, which is a very strong lineage, a very strong. On both sides. Yes, on both sides. So there's kind of a joke um, in Judaism with a kernel of truth that's supposed to sum up the Jewish holidays 
uh, it goes, they tried to kill us. We won. Let's eat. <laughs> yes. So certainly, certainly Hanukkah, poor and Passover, you can, you can see that. So there seems to be a big connection between food and Jewish culture and Jewish tradition. You know, in fact, Jeannie, I spent a lot of this quarantine time watching Israeli television. I don't know if you've seen Shtisel. You I did. I loved it. it. I loved it. And, and, and could you believe it? all the food? I mean, every I almost every scene, <laughs> it was about food and eating and dreams about food and <laughs> marriage because of food. And it got me thinking about this connection between food and Judaism. And I wanted to hear your thoughts about that. So one of the the things that really, um, so after we moved mom to the memory care place, where by the way, she still is, she's 92 years old. Um, I found amongst all of these papers, I went into the drawer and I, and the drawers, and I found hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of recipes tiny little snippets of paper written in different handwritings going back to who knows when, you know, they were stained and sometimes the same recipes were written over and over and over again. And I decided to, you know, compile it, put it together. And that's my cookbook. Okay. So the recipe of my 15 grandmothers is a book that is really a, a compiling of all of these little recipes that I found in my mom's drawer that day. So the first thing I did is I separated them all to try to make them look like from different eras because the handwritings were so different. There were several hundred tiny little pieces of paper. And then I translated them all into English. And I saw that it was almost impossible with the measurements to, to get them anywhere to a workable place because the measurements were like an egg full of oil. And, and a cup full of water. So how big the egg, how much cup, how much sugar. So I put it all together and I sent them out to 150 girlfriends and colleagues around the world. And I said, help. So some of them had to be made in eight and 10 times just to get. And one interesting thing is that in every case, all of the recipes were, according to the cooks, were too eggy. So one woman had started with 12 eggs, as the recipe called, and ended up with two large eggs. Because way back when, the eggs were probably smaller. Sure. So and they we're just- growing had... these giant eggs now. Yeah. Right. So all of these comments were coming back saying, the recipe's too eggy, and it's too eggy. So one of the most important, there's several very important recipes in the book. One of the most important is one that when I would see it in my grandmother's book, it was called pork chop. And oh man, pork chop really bothered me. I was giving to these women a lot of the recipes and I would just flip by pork chop because it upset me that they should be eating pork chops, which are so forbidden to us as Jews. So finally, before I put my grandmother's, that was her own journal manual with a pork chop. And before I put it away, I said, you know what? Let me read pork chop. And maybe I can change it to lamb chop or, or veal chop, but not use pork. So actually pork chop was the most important recipe that we had because it's a recipe that was French toast made to look like a pork chop uh -huh. wow. and covered with red peppers and tomato jam. And then as I started reading the history, because food is so important important and, and connects us as a people. Like you said, they used to take a real pork chop. They used to burn it in the fire so that the whole house would smell like a pork chop. And then they would eat this recipe and they look exactly like a pork chop. I also have another one that's called uh, Boyo Maimon. But that pork chop, the, the significance of that was that it would it was a way of hiding. So they looked like they were eating pork, but so obviously they wouldn't be Jewish, but it wasn't really pork. So they didn't really have to abandon their faith. Correct. And it was really, it's something, it's like a French toast. It's made of bread, sugar, milk, and vanilla. And uh, it's actually, I've had it. It's quite good eaten with syrup. Jeannie, how old do you think these recipes are? You know, uh, Robin, I'm not sure. Uh, I 
because of their historical significance, I would assume that pork chop is uh, mid 1600s. Wow. Because after 1690, and I have researched this family from top to bottom, after 1690, I did not see anybody being caught by the Inquisition anymore. So what that told me was that they had succumbed to just saying, okay, basta, we're just going to be Catholic from here on in. Before 1690, they were caught every second day by the Inquisition. So I think that they just gave up and threw their arms up. And as the generations came, they just said, you know what, this is crazy. And we're just going to be Catholic from now on. And that's what happened. But these customs remained. So I think that they go back to the mid-1600s. You were starting to mention another recipe. There's another recipe that was actually picked up last year during Hanukkah by the New York Times called churros. That was, uh, they did a whole uh, expose on churros, which are of of the Mexican culture, of the Spanish culture, the, the Caribbean culture. And apparently, and I did not know this, churros, which are these fried dough that we eat in December, obviously during Hanukkah time, apparently is a food that is very highly known to have come from the Jews. We also have another food that in my book, which is like ears, which mean ears, and that was eaten uh, during the carnivals. And I think that meant the carnivals of Purim. Remember, there was no explanations, just um, just recipes. So it's in the shape of an ear. And during the ho- the holiday of Purim, we eat the homentashen, which is supposed to be in the shape of the ear. So um, it, hey, it's there. right. It's it's very cultural. So there's another cake called Maimon cake. And that one, I can't believe, survived the centuries because that is the name of our biggest, uh, one of our biggest sages from Spain, Maimonides. And uh, and so one of the cakes is Maimon cake. So the other very interesting thing is that I was able to follow the diaspora of my grandmother's with the different re- the different ingredients in the same recipe. So, for example, you start off with a, uh, a uh, anise was very big in Spain in their region. I could almost, if the recipe contained anise and almonds and olive oil and flour in whatever concentration, it was from Western Spain, where my family's from near Portugal. But the minute that they moved to like the Canary Islands, the anise was gone. And then when they moved to Costa Rica, all of a sudden it became like fig liquor. When they moved to Cuba, it became rum. So it was interesting. And I had all the little papers, starting with the anise, moving through the fig. In Cartagena, Colombia, they were using an orange liquor. So it was interesting to watch the diaspora via the recipes. I already knew the diaspora. I'm not sure that I could have done it backwards. That's fascinating. I'm not sure I could have figured it out without actually knowing it. Right. But you could see it. Once you knew it, you could see where the ingredients came in. That's fascinating. It really really is. It taught me a lot about my family. And a lot of people have asked me, did I not resent the fact is my mom really had a very hard time with my uh, returning to Judaism. And a lot of people asked me, did I not resent the fact that she didn't give me all those documents and especially didn't give me the recipes because the recipes are a big deal. And my answer to that is initially my initial, I mean, I'm human. So when I saw all that in the drawers and suitcases, I was like, Oh my gosh, you know how many years and I, it was like a flash of anger. And then I said, no, because my mom and grandmothers could have thrown it away when they came from Cuba and they had limited amount of stuff that they could bring, or when they made their journeys from Spain to Cuba or from Costa Rica and the Canary Islands, 
And the grandmothers chose to treasure these things. And my mom chose to treasure these things. I can only be grateful. Whether she wanted to talk about it or she didn't want to talk about it is irrelevant because the fact remains that it's my legacy now for my own grandchildren. So Jeannie, why? Why are recipes so important? I I think that, I like, you know, we talked about there is a lot of history in these recipes, instinctively or intuitively or whatever we want to call it. The grandmothers knew that they were passing their history to us in the only way they knew how. Yeah. And, you know, let me give another thought, which is something that's so important in Judaism is Lador Vador which is generation to generation, which is this connection of each generation to Judaism. It's so important to pass the Jewish faith on from generation to generation. And these recipes and the food traditions, as your grandmother said, they're just family customs, allow that to happen. Correct. And I I think that I am... I will always be eternally grateful because out of everything that I have found, and I started my journey back in, in the late 1980s. I mean, there is a lot of water under the bridge in my return to the Jewish people. And I think that the grandmothers had a way of ensuring that this continued forward and forward and forward. And eventually someone was going to jump up and see the value. And that person was me. For whatever reason, that person was me. All right, let's go back. Uh, the story of the, you you touched on the periquillos. Is that how you say it? Periquillos. Periquillos. And that was the story that you said was one of the most important. Your grandmother made sure that you knew how to make that Tell me, what what is that a sweet? Is that a cake? It uh, is basically me. a ball of dough that tastes like anise, and you either love it or you hate it. And anise and very sweet, and when you fry it, it opens up a little, like a little mouth to look like a parrot, like a little beak. And in, in Spanish, perico is a, a parrot, and so this, this particular uh, dessert is called periquillo. And this is the one, the one where my grandmother taught me everything about doing the, not the blessing, but taking the dough, checking for the blood in the eggs, checking for insects in the, in the flour. So this is a very important one because this is the one that, that really had my grandmother teaching me everything on. And it is a family favorite, this one. Well, Jeannie, I think this is a fascinating story. The cookbook is called Recipes of My 15 Grandmothers, Unique Recipes and Stories from the Times of the Crypto Jews During the Spanish Inquisition. It's an amazing story and great recipes. And I thank you so much for for letting us in on this part of your life. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. And the book is available on Amazon and it's in English and Spanish. If someone wants, all of my books are in my, in the two languages. So, um, you know, and I think I told you, I'm very proud that it just won a Latino author book award. Yeah. Fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you so much. It's been a true pleasure. That was Jeannie Milgram, author of My 15 Grandmothers and the cookbook, Recipes from My 15 Grandmothers. We have Jeannie's recipe for perequillos on our website, thezestpodcast.com. Come connect with us. We're on Facebook at The Zest Podcast. I'm Robin Sussingham. Dalia Colon and I produce The Zest with help from Cheyenne Jaglal and Mark Hayes. Copyright 2020, WUSF Public Media, University of South Florida.